I'll start off talking a little bit about what the book is about, um, and then read from the book um, uh, some excerpts. And I had the darndest time trying to figure out what's a sensible excerpt from the book to share with you. Because um, basically it was like, how about these 50 pages? <laughs> no, that wasn't going to work. So I, I, I hope I've selected a couple of snippets that give you a sense of the story and the book um, and my experiences there. Uh, I'm going to start out with what the book's about just by reading from the first page of the book. Um, it's a place of privilege and it's about Dalton and my experiences there. Um, and uh, I'd love to get lots and lots of questions when we're all done because I'm sure I'm going to create questions. There are private schools all across the country, places with better resources, better teachers, better budgets. By definition, these schools are not for the public. They are private. They are exclusive. They are for those who can afford better. Rarely does that include black students. In the 1960s, it almost never did. And then, there are the ultra-elite private schools, the super schools, places where the resources, the curriculum, and the tuition are comparable to the best liberal arts colleges. These are schools that taught computer programming to high school students using the same state-of-the-art machines that NASA used, and offered classes in Russian taught by a Russian countess. These are schools that served London Broil in the cafeteria, along with eclairs that rivaled the French patisserie around the corner. These are schools where lineage is a factor in the admission process. These are not schools for those who can afford better. These are schools for those who can afford only the very best. These are places of privilege. Think that's an exaggeration? Let's put that in terms of simple dollars and cents. In New York, the average tuition for a year of private high school is $24,000. That's $2,000 a month. And that's an average that includes mostly subsidized parochial schools. New York's ultra-elite private schools are in a different league entirely. At New York's top 100 private schools, tuition begins at $50,000 a year and continues to climb like a Saturn rocket. One year, uh, tuition at Think Global, a progressive alternative school on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, is $85,000. What if you have more than one child? In New York, the crown jewel place of privilege is the Dalton School, one of the most prestigious elite prep schools in the nation, recognized globally for its visionary, progressive educational philosophy and its ultra-wealthy celebrity student body. Whenever popular culture needs a readily recognizable reference for the alma mater of the extraordinarily rich and famous, they simply say Dalton. Dalton is where Anderson Cooper was a student, Jeffrey Epstein was a teacher, Robert Redford and Bob Fosse were members of the PTA. <clears throat> Time Magazine called Dalton the most progressive of the city's chic schools and the most chic of the city's progressive schools. Dalton and the extraordinary places of privilege like it are where the purebred 1% are taught and groomed to become the next generation of America's power elite. In the mid-1960s, the trustees of Dalton and its new headmaster, Donald Barr, father of the former attorney general, committed themselves and their school to a course of actions that would not merely embrace change, but would attempt to shape that change into a better, more progressive, more inclusive, and more diverse future. Dalton reached out to previously unfamiliar communities and actively recruited minority students. I'm one of those students. Place of Privilege provides the remarkable narrative of the Pathfinder course that my life would take as well as the stories of my black classmates. Place of Privilege is our story, how Dalton changed our lives 
and how our lives changed Dalton. So, in a nutshell, that's what my book is about. That experience being among the very first black students to attend Dalton. Um, the excerpt that I'd like to read is from my interview at Dalton for admission, um, which I think is a little window into me as much as it is Dalton. On this particular day, I was coming with my mother for my admission interview at Dalton. It was not my first time visiting the school. My older brother, Michael, was currently a senior and had been attending Dalton for three years after spending his freshman year at Stuyvesant. So, spoiler alert, wow. I'm not the first black kid to attend Dalton. I was probably about number 10. My older brother, Michael, he was the very first black student to ever attend Dalton. So he gets that particular historic distinction. Um, but I followed fairly close by. I had been to see Michael perform in a school play to compete in a fencing tournament. I always thought it was the height of sophistication that a high school had a fencing team. And to sing in the glee club. This, however, would be my first visit to Dalton for me, for my own needs and purposes. Dalton is located at 108 East 89th Street between Lexington and Park Avenues, nestled between luxury high-rise, pre-war apartment buildings with uniform doormen on Manhattan's Tony Upper East Side. The sidewalk is well shaded, lined with mature Japanese ginkgo biloba trees and hybrid thornless honey locust trees, where local residents would walk their apartment-sized, expensive, purebred dogs, and Caribbean nannies would push classic-style Kensington baby prams made with black nylon taffeta. Now, it would be reasonable to assume that these nannies that you saw all the time were caring for the young children of working mothers and fathers, young urban professionals, and that nannies were necessary because both parents worked. But the truth was that this was the late 1960s, and most of these moms did not work outside the home. Frankly, they didn't work inside the home either. They simply had nannies to care for their children and housekeepers to care for their oversized apartments. That simply was the way it was. Dalton's location somehow managed to be both completely cosmopolitan yet still somehow a world apart. Dalton's front facade was enclosed by a 10-foot black wrought iron fence and gate that never gave the appearance of keeping anyone out. Instead, the fence was merely a convenience for students to lean against, usually while smoking a cigarette, or for draping their deep blue canvas Dalton book bag while spending time with friends. At intervals, that seemed to be literally whenever the school wished. East 89th Street would completely close to automobile traffic so that Dalton's younger students could play safely in the street. They simply closed the street. The administrative offices, located on the second floor of Dalton's 12-story building, although only one floor up, everyone took the lobby elevators to the second floor where the doors opened to a long corridor illuminated by track lighting that focused on artwork displayed on walls and white pedestal cubes at irregular intervals. The ivory-colored carpeting was deep enough to absorb almost all of the sound from the offices, creating a hushed tone of discreet business. The hushed atmosphere on the second floor was a very deliberate counterpoint to the matic clatter and pace of the rest of the school building. When someone called one of the offices on the second floor, the phones did not ring. They purred like kittens. Really, it was a bit otherworldly. The second door to the left was the admission office, and Mrs. Cameron was the director of admission. Agnes Theodora Teddy Cameron was a slender woman in her early 40s who wore her hair short in a late 1960s modern professional style that revealed just a hint of gray. This was a woman who would never contemplate hair coloring. I don't actually know that much about Miss Cameron's background, but she struck me as someone who could easily have been a neighbor of the Kennedys 
on Hyannisport. Someone who enjoyed spending time outdoors, probably had athletic older brothers, and was the product of a highbrow New England upbringing. She wore pearls and tweed, and it all seemed completely natural and unpretentious. On her. Mrs. Cameron greeted my mother and me with genuine warmth, and after a few moments of introductory conversation, she directed my mother to have a seat in the ante room while she invited me into her office for my interview. I know that there are a lot of elements to the admission process, applications, disclosure forms, admission exams, but I don't really remember any of that. All I remember is my interview with Mrs. Cameron. While the corridor on the second floor was brightly lit in white and ivory, the inside of Mrs. Cameron's office was the opposite. The room was a cocoon of polished mahogany bookcases with books in nearly every space and nook. The room was lamplit and intimate. Her desk was covered in folders and papers, but didn't seem the least bit disheveled or disorganized. But it wasn't neat either. It was simply relaxed. She began our conversation by talking about my brother Michael a senior at Dalton who had done very well at the school. I wasn't aware of it at the time, but my brother Michael had been a member of Dalton's very first class of male high school students. Dalton had been co-educational in the lower grades for a number of years, but had only just begun admitting boys into the high school. And more importantly, Michael had been Dalton's very first African-American male student. Although it was not discussed openly, and certainly not with any of us in any open way. It was a very, very big deal. Michael was a mile marker in Dalton's history. Michael did very well at Dalton. He fit in comfortably in Dalton's academic and social ecosystems. It's not to say that Michael didn't struggle at first or that he didn't face both resistance and rejection in the beginning. In some respects, Michael's challenges were far greater than my own when it was my turn to attend Dalton. Being the first meant you were constantly surrounded by people, some well-intentioned, some not, who had absolutely no experience interacting with Negro boys. Many weren't sure that they wanted to. That goes for teachers, administrative staff, and fellow students. Even Dalton's janitorial staff and elevator operators were white, mostly immigrants from Eastern Europe, and from communities whose experience with black people was either antagonistic or non-existent. And they surely didn't know what to make of us. After all, to most Dalton students, the janitorial staff were all but invisible, just like their domestic staff at home. And these workers understood their place in the social order. But they didn't know how they were expected to treat Negroes, especially Negro boys. There were no rules for this, spoken, or unspoken. But as the Marine Corps adage goes, Michael improvised, he adapted, and he overcame. And he did it better than most. Consequently, my entire Dalton experience, from the admission interview through all my years there, was spent either in my brother's shadow or measured by its contrast to his prior tenure. I don't blame or begrudge my brother. He he wasn't the one constantly throwing this up in my face. He wasn't around. He was off at college. But all my teachers knew Michael. They loved him. The administrators knew Michael. And if that wasn't enough, even my own classmates had a connection to Michael. At least a half a dozen of my classmates had older siblings that had been in the same year as Michael. And they were old friends. Michael had been to their homes. There were three words that I heard constantly through all my time at Dalton. How's your brother? <laughs> and those were the three words that began my conversation with Mrs. Cameron. She wanted to know if he and I had talked about my application to Dalton. She wanted to know if he had expressed an opinion to me. Her tone was neutral enough that I couldn't tell if she was trying to find out if Michael thought highly enough of Dalton to recommend it to his brother, or if Michael thought highly enough of his brother to recommend me to Dalton. In fact, Michael had wished me luck and then promptly dismissed the wish 
with a wave of his hand saying, I'm sure you'll get in. But I didn't tell her that. Instead, I told her that he merely asked me to share my impressions when I returned home from the interview. I don't recall most of the questions that Mrs. Cameron asked me that day. I'm sure many were standard interview questions. Some were standard Dalton questions. Those were questions that resulted from Dalton's rarefied status as an elite and exclusive academic institution. And some were questions carefully chosen to evaluate the admission of a Negro boy to the Dalton School, carefully crafted psychological questions. The one question that has stayed in my memory, however, was the one question that seemed to make the biggest impression on Mrs. Cameron. She said, Mar, if you could be any animal, any animal at all, which animal would you choose? I think I would be a cat. And why is that? She smiled at what was a fairly pedestrian answer to her question probably already beginning to form an opinion about my aptitude and my potential. I had no preparation for this interview. I didn't know what the questions might be asked. I certainly had not given any prior thought to why I might be, want to be a cat. We never owned a cat, and I didn't particularly like cats. We owned dogs. I like dogs. But the words just popped into my head, coming from no place in particular. Well. For starters, I would not want to be any animal that typically people consider to be food. While they're alive, we don't really treat them like living creatures. We just treat them like a product for our consumption. That can be pretty awful. So that eliminates quite a lot of choices. OK, Mrs. Cameron nodded her head. And I would not want to be any animal that people wore as clothing, whether feathers or fur or leather for a moment. I'm not saying that I don't wear leather or anything like that. I just wouldn't want to be leather. So that eliminates a bunch more choices. It does. I wouldn't want to be some rare or exotic animal because many of them are at risk of extinction. The others are caught and put in zoos and that doesn't seem like a happy life. It isn't a life that I would choose for myself. I understand. So you would want to be a pet. Well, yes and no, I said, still thinking through what was on my mind. Birds and hamsters live in cages. Fish and turtle live in tanks and bowls. It's like a zoo, only smaller. I took a deep sigh. Basically, there's only cats and dogs. So why not a dog, Mrs. Cameron? I love dogs. I love my dog, Max, I admitted. But people impose a lot of expectations on dogs. Dogs are supposed to be obedient and loyal. Dogs are supposed to play with us whenever we want them to. Dogs are supposed to guard us and protect us. It just seems like we ask an awful lot. But we don't do that with cats. If you have a cat for a pet, you don't ask a cat to be anything except be a cat. Maybe be our companion. We accept the cat just the way it is. That's what I want, just to be accepted the way I am and not how someone else wants me to be. Well, Mrs. Cameron said, that's a pretty terrific answer. Thank you. I guess someone's asked you this question before she smiled. No, I shook my head. Never. And at the risk of gross oversimplification, that's how I got into Dalton. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm at Dalton. And this is a little bit about some of my early experience there. A different chapter. My dad had grown up without a father. He never had much of a sports orientation or experience. He never got to play catch with his dad or talk about sports teams or their favorite athletes. I had grown up pretty much the same way. My dad's ambivalence to participation in sports had been passed down to me. So when I arrived at Dalton, I had neither the prior experience nor the inclination to sign up for any team sports. This naturally surprised school officials 
who assumed that all black kids had a consuming passion and a natural gift for playing sports. Now, it wasn't until my senior year that I joined any sports at all. I signed up for judo, and for a time, I was quite good at it. That was until I found myself in a match against a classmate, Adrian Van Larmelden, who was at least twice my size. Now, size doesn't always matter in judo until it really does. Adrian picked me up and flipped me like I was a rag doll. I hit the mat so hard it seemed that the building shook. More than 40 years later, my back still vividly and painfully remembers that day. One of the activities that I did join, however, was the middle school yearbook committee. I think I was recruited by the two girls who led the committee, Gwen Fader and Susie Wells. Gwen and Susie were both very outgoing social personalities, precisely the kind of people who should manage a yearbook, and also precisely the kind of people who were totally comfortable befriending me, one of the new black kids in school, and persuading him to join the yearbook committee. That included going to their homes after school and on occasional weekends to work on the yearbook. We became good friends that year, and working on the yearbook became a useful window into learning more about my other classmates. Gwen and Susie made the effort to befriend me, and through them, an invitation that granted me an entrance into the Dalton student world. And by the end of that first year, I no longer felt like a stranger at Dalton. I knew my way around. I knew the way things were. I could anticipate and interpret experiences, and to a limited degree, I could manipulate circumstances to my advantage, at least to my comfort. But familiarity is not the same as integration. Knowing the Dalton world, my peers, my teachers, my environment, didn't make me one of them. I had a permanent guest pass but I was nevertheless, unmistakably, a guest. You see, there was always one, this one simple, immutable, practical barrier between true Daltonians and the minority kids such as myself. Money. Your identity as a school-age kid defined you by the things that you could do, by the experiences that were possible for you, by your lifestyle. And lifestyle and life experience were fueled by money. Lots and lots of money. And the privileges that it buys. For us minority kids, travel was what you did to and from school. For our Dalton classmates, travel meant someplace fun for the weekend because all of the East Coast ski resorts were going to be crowded. For our Dalton classmates, summer was a verb. In the mid-1980s, about 10 years after we left Dalton, there was a TV show hosted by Robin Leach called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. It was a voyeuristic orgy of all the fabulous homes, cars, clothes, and various goings on of the famous and not so famous wealthy people. The show was a huge hit and remained on the air for over a decade. Americans seemed to be fascinated by peeking around the curtain to see the lives of the rich and famous. But for me, and for other minority kids who went to Dalton, we were familiar with this world from a very different perspective. For us, the rich and famous were just the kids in math class and in the lunchroom. Sure, there was luxury and glamour to their lives, but there was also banality. On TV, champagne wishes and caviar dreams is a wonderful, exotic, ethereal dream, a fantasy. In high school, all of those things just become things that other kids have that you don't have. In high school, all of those things just become another brick in the load of teenage alienation. There's a natural tendency among teenagers to be competitive, to try to one-up each other, sometimes in a good-spirited, friendly way, sometimes not. Sometimes there was the pungent whip of Lord of the Flies in the air. But it didn't matter. On most metrics that mattered to us kids, 
there was simply no way that black students could compete. You couldn't outdress them. Some girls had wardrobe budgets that were equal to other people's household income. And many of the guys were into conspicuously dressing down, overtly shunning the appearance of that affluence. And when it came to, what did you do this weekend, we didn't even bother to try. Water breaks. <laughs> Even if you were very smart, you were never recognized as the smartest kid in the class. The teachers had their favorites, and we were never. Forget about trying to be better. It was hard enough just trying to establish your bona fides as a peer, as one of the group. And you never really quite made that. Some of the black kids excelled at athletics. Sadly, I was not one of them. Ray Smoltz, my co-author, was a natural athlete who dominated the basketball court and the football field. But that's what Dalton expected of us. That's what they assumed we all could do. So the achievement always had an asterisk that dismissed its value. There was one other thing that we could do that they couldn't. One other thing that, truth be told, could occasionally trigger a twinge of jealousy among the white kids. We could be us. There's just something about black people when we are being confident and comfortable in who we are, when our joy is observable by others, that causes them to say, I want what they're having. They love our music, our dance, our comedy, our culture. They do their best to copy it. This is why there are ever-present, often unfortunate, unfortunate expressions of cultural appropriation. Of course, there are also times when our observable joy leaves a bitter taste in the mouths because they simply don't understand how or why we could be happier than they are. Not even for the briefest of moments. Their belief system and value system demand that they have the preeminent right to happiness, and the rest of us should enjoy the leftovers. Us being us was sometimes viewed as an assault on those beliefs and values. And so, us being us was frequently regarded as acting up, being disruptive, and failing to adapt and assimilate. Now, I want to pause here for a moment in my description of the briar patch nature of Dalton to point out and make clear that I have very fond memories of Dalton and many happy experiences at Dalton. These are the reasons that I've stayed connected to the school over the years since graduation. I loved Dalton. In fact, it's worth repeating. I loved Dalton. The problem, and the important truth, however, is that Dalton didn't always love me back. So. Well, that's what I picked to read. Um, so, rather than continuing to ramble on, uh, the Dalton experience for me um, empowered me and enabled me to see truly through the belief that the sky really is blue. That whatever my expectations were, whatever I thought my potential was, Dalton said, no, you can actually do more than that. You can reach higher. You can be better. There is no limitation that you should find acceptable. That was the standard that they set for all of their students. And on that principle, on that basis, that was the standard that they set for us as well. And that, as much as anything else about my Dalton experience, literally changed my life. There were many times when the world around me wanted me to accept the fact that, OK, this is the glass ceiling. This is as far as you can go. And my response was, somebody hand me a hammer. 
Defend yourself at all times. And that was another lesson that Dalton taught me. Often, Dalton taught me to defend myself at all times from Dalton. And Dalton was not bashful about taking swings at its minority students. But it said, let that be a lesson to you. And it worked out for the best. Dalton's got a lot of things that it needs to do to grow and be better. Um, recently, uh, Dalton's headmaster, although they call him head of school now, they don't say headmaster, but old habits die hard, um, sent a letter out to all of its parents and students and alumnus pledging a, a renewed commitment to become an anti-racist institution. And I'm working with the school now to help them on that journey. It has a ways to go, but it is well-intentioned, and I would never underestimate Dalton in anything that it tries to do. Uh, at this point, I'm hoping to field as many questions as possible. Yes? Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, one of the themes in the book is invisibility. That we were invisible to Dalton and to the teachers, I mean, most of the teachers at Dalton. They just didn't see us. They saw some preset expectation of what our presence represented, but they didn't actually see us. And it didn't necessarily bother anybody that they weren't seeing us. Um, that is a significant challenge to overcome. And I think that um, that is your best response to the situation is to demand visibility, demand to be seen for the unique things that your your child brings to the school and that your child needs to get from the school. That to generalize about your child is to underserve him or her. Um, you have individual needs that need to be recognized, understood, and responded to. Um, I mentioned that I'm working with the school on the work they're doing now. One of the things that um, that my group uh, said to the uh, current head of school that they need to do, we identified three priorities. And priority number one was helping the parents of minority students understand what their bill of rights as consumers are. That many of these minority parents um, uh, are first time experience of an environment like a place like Dalton. And so they have no idea what to expect. They have no idea what the school owes them or what they can ask of the school. And they are too intimidated to ask anything of the school. Um, and for the, as part of the research for writing the book, I talked to a couple dozen 
recent students or graduates. And without fail, they all talked about how their parents, who never had this kind of an educational experience, um, all tell them, I don't care if you're unhappy. I didn't send you to Dalton to be happy. I sent you there to get the best possible education money can buy. And I am scripting and saving and sacrificing everything I have so that you get that. So if you come home unhappy, tell it to somebody else. And I, as hard as that is, I have to respect both that student and that parent for the way that they're coping with that situation. But that parent has a right to go to the school and say, you know what, I'm spending a lot of money here. I need to be sure I get my money's worth. You know? And even if I'm not spending a lot of money here, because you have some students who are on scholarship, and believe me, the school will make sure you never forget that you're on scholarship. <laughs> you know? But it doesn't matter. That transaction needs to be set to the side so that you say, I'm here, damn it. And if you admitted me, I get the full menu. Uh, you had a question. Well, I hate to bring up your brother again. <laughs> <laughs> damn it. <laughs> say to you, all right, watch out for this and this and this and just ignore that. And did, did he, before you came, did he try and steal you to some of these slings and arrows or? Not really, because when he graduated, he went off to college. So he wasn't around that much. Um, I got some advice from him, um, but his, his perspective was, if I can do it, meaning him, then certainly Mark can do it. Um, and so he didn't, didn't really have any day-to-day -day practical advice for me. Um, I would talk to him from time to time while he was at college, and you know, we'd come home for the holidays, and I'd share with him some of my experiences, and he would nod his head and go, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I know that experience, um, but he didn't really feel the need to be my coach for any of that. As an older brother, I can attest to that. That's <laughs> not your job. Yeah, I mean, you know. Are you an older brother? No, I said as an older brother. As an older brother. Yeah, and you, you have to always get it off easy, so, you know, I got to Yeah, plus, there was a healthy attitude of, nobody gave me any pointers, why should you get some? Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody else? Yes, Can you explain how um, Dalton found your brother? Or did your brother find Dalton? Or did your parents find Dalton? Um, Dalton found Michael. Uh, he had um, uh, attended and passed through a uh, regular public school in Queens, where we lived and, and where we grew up. Um, and then for high school, um, well, when he was in middle school, about to go into high school, his guidance counselor said to my parents, Michael shouldn't go to the high school around here. The high school around here isn't going to meet his needs. He's better than that. Um, he should go to one of the cities, uh, I forget what they call them, I think they're the gifted and talented schools and so forth, and Stuyvesant was one of them. So he took the test to attend Stuyvesant. Um, and he did his freshman year of high school at Stuyvesant. Um, and, uh, you know, Stuyvesant is an enormous school. I, I think it's like 3,000 kids. Um, it, and, and an enormous physical building. Um, but while he was at Stuyvesant his freshman year was when Dalton was deciding, we're going to bring boys into the high school, and with that, we're going to bring black boys into the high school. And they went looking for them. 
and the natural place to look is at the city's gifted and talented school, uh, schools. Um, but uh, uh, in the book, I also talk about the fact that when Dalton went co-ed, which was important for a variety of reasons, they, um, they had a lot of parents who had sons who went to the lower school and who were forced out once they completed middle school, and so they had a lot of unhappy parents saying, I want my son to be able to go to the high school, which was all girls for 75 years. Um, so this made a lot of Dalton's parents very happy that their sons would be able to go to the high school. But more importantly than that, Dalton wanted to have male athletic teams because male athletic teams are money. And Dalton could smell the money from a mile away. But Dalton also recognized, if you're gonna have male athletic teams, you need winning male athletic teams. And for that, they wanted black kids. So that's why they brought us in. Yes, ma'am? I'm just curious, is Michael's coloring similar to yours? Is his what similar? His coloring is. Oh, no, um, that's, uh, uh, the thing that many uh, white folks don't fully appreciate is that black people come in every possible I'm shape, sure, but even within a single household. Right. Um, no two people in my family are the same shape, and Michael is much darker than me. Um, uh, so, although we have similar facial features, his skin color is, is much darker than my own. Um, Michael is the middle brother. Our oldest brother is David. And I'll, I'll share with you an interesting story about David. Um, my aunt, Millie, my mom's sister, Millie, is the very first black person to attend Dalton. She's the first black girl to attend Dalton in 1948. Um, and back then, the only reason that they admitted black girls to Dalton was that for a handful of reasons, Dalton had fallen onto financial hard times. It was right after World War II, and um, people just weren't spending a lot of money donating it to their private school alma mater. Um, and the headmaster, the founder, Helen Parkhurst, was an educational visionary and an absolutely horrid financial steward. Um, so she had spent money on all kinds of things without making sure the school was financially or fiscally sound. Um, and the school went to the federal government and said, we need some money. And the federal government, uh, under President Truman, said, sure, no problem. Admit some black kids. Do that, we'll give you some money. And so they did. Um, and they had um, two black girls per class for the first 10 years from 1948 on. And then I think it became three black girls per class after that. But my Aunt Millie was the very first one. And back then in 1948, 1950, um, Dalton had a program for teaching girls how to be good mothers. So they had a nursery in the school where you learn how to take care of babies. Um, and you know, various moms volunteered to have their babies come in and be in the nursery as tools for the girls to learn how to be moms. And my oldest brother David was born in 1950, um, and uh, Millie was, I guess, a sophomore or a junior at that point. And she went to the teacher that was the head of the program and said, my sister just had a baby. Would you like her to bring the baby into the nursery? And that, of course, prompted a whole bunch of conversations among teachers and administrators. Do, do we want her to bring her baby into the nursery? Is that really a good idea? And ultimately, they decided, sure. Let's bring in little baby David into the nursery. And um, uh, David is lighter skin than I am with green eyes. 
And so little baby David is in the nursery, and as soon as word gets around the entire school, there's a Negro baby in the nursery. Everybody finds an occasion to go visit the nursery to go take a look. And it's like, where's the Negro baby? I don't see him. And David was there, but they couldn't identify which one was David. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Given the family connection and the legacy of how many of your family attended, what was the reaction from the school when you published this book? Um, the, the school was actually very supportive during the uh, writing and research process and very helpful. Uh, and I'm very grateful to the school for being helpful because I was apprehensive that the school was going to put up this wall and say, you know, we are not going to help this book. Um, but they were very helpful, and, and sincerely so. And um, uh, the head of school, a uh, woman, woman by the name of Ellen Stein, um, who uh, also happened to be a classmate of Michael. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> um, uh, she came to me at one point um, when the book was almost finished, and she said, Mark, am I going to like this book? And I said, Ellen, we're like an old married couple. We know each other's faults from head to toe, but we still love each other in spite of them. I said, the book will show that. And after the book was done and came out um, this past summer, uh, she was one of the first people to uh, reach out to me and say, I read the book and I have sent a memo to the entire senior administration staff that they are required to read the book and we will be discussing it during our management retreat. So. Denise. Uh, how diverse is Dalton today? How diverse is Dalton today? Dalton is significantly more diverse today than it was back then. Um, uh, somewhere between 45 and 50 percent of the student body is um, students of color. Um, so they have they have made a substantial leap forward in that respect. Um, and in the early 2000s. Um, Dalton, in fact, made diversity part of its official mission statement. So um, they began the diversity process in earnest really in the 90s, but in the early 2000s they said, this is part of what we say defines us. Uh, and they've done a good job with that as far as the student body is concerned. Unfortunately, as far as the faculty is concerned, Dalton is no more diverse today than it was when I attended in the late 1960s. It is unchanged. And it is one of the areas of real criticism that I have of the school. And one of the areas of real criticism, criticisms I have of the Ridgefield Public School System, to be honest. Yeah. Um, you know, Richfield does not have a large black population or minority population. And our representation among faculty in the school system absolutely reflects that. Less than 1% of our teachers. Yes? And, and why do you think that is? The talent is out there of people of various ethnic backgrounds. Why, why do you think that is personally? I think that there is a culture within our community, and this is not universal, but um, my experience is that squeaky wheels get the oil. And there is a culture in our community of, I moved to Richfield to get away from that. Mm -hmm. And so I certainly don't want to encourage anything that brings more of that here. Mm -hmm. To get away from integration? Yes, to get away from the diversity found in urban environments. Um, and also, to be perfectly fair and honest, 
there is also resistance among minority teachers to come to a community like Ridgefield. It's like, I don't want to be the one. You know? If, 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 if I came in good numbers, I'd feel better about it. But nobody wants to be the one. You had to. I, I have two questions. So what do we do about that? I, I imagine we're going to the board then and we start to have conversations because there is research that says that teachers of color, even for white kids, have a tremendous impact. For some reason, they, they get, like, kids pay attention to a teacher of color, especially if they're one of the few teachers of color. There's research that supports that. But now what do you do? We just had this election, and a lot of the Board of Ed election was based on critical race, critical race theory. Um, it just, it's getting really, gnarly and heated now. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you, I, to, and I totally love everything about what you are doing right now, so I'm not asking this in a confrontational way, but like, why did you write this book? Like, what can we do, like, what do you want us to take away and empower us with so that we can go forth in our <coughs> and do something? Um. I wrote this book, and it's, it's co-written. I want to be sure to give credit to my co-author, Raymond Smaltz, who is uh, my classmate at Dalton. Um, uh, Ray and I started writing this book 10 years ago. Um, back in uh, 2010, Ray and I um, met each other for dinner, and that was the first time we had spoken or laid eyes on each other in 35 years. We had no contact with each other for all those years after Dalton. And in 2010, through Facebook, so I, you know, I give Facebook credit where it's due, um, we reconnected and we had dinner at P.F. Chang's in the White Plains Mall. Um, and we ordered appetizers, one or two appetizers and said, well, we'll, we'll order dinner in, in a bit, and we just started talking. Three and a half hours later, we never ordered dinner, and they asked us to leave, because they were closing. Um, we just talked and talked and talked for hours, and at the end of the evening, we said, we need to do something with these stories. We need to share them, um, because these stories are, are as interesting and as um, deeply felt as when we lived them 35 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, and so we started writing the book. Of course, at the time, um, we were writing the book while living our lives and having other things to do, and both gainfully employed in things that didn't involve writing a book. So it moved very, very slowly for quite a long time. And then in 2017, I got prostate cancer and spent a lot of time not working. So I had time to start working on the book. And that was the momentum that really got the book finished um, and, and, and to where we are. So. Uh, and what do I want the book to accomplish? Um, a couple of things, but I don't know that I would be willing to say that the book has a mission. I don't think it has a mission other than to hear me, you know, which is a, a, a fundamental human need. Everybody wants to be seen and heard, and I want to be seen and heard for my stories and my truth. But I, I guess what I would want other people to take away from the book is um, that uh, Black students um, are different than and more than what you think you're looking at when you look at them. Um, and therefore, hopefully, it opens your eyes to say, oh, I need to take a closer look. I need to listen better to who I'm talking to and understand what I'm seeing and who I'm seeing. Um, uh, and there is much that we can take away from each other and learn from each other and benefit from each other in doing that um, for the 
minority students of today, um, it's as painful as some of your day-to-day -day experiences may be, you're actually going to survive this and thrive from it. Um, that this painful experience is going to be one of the best things that ever happened to you. Um, and come through it with that confidence. Come through it knowing that um, you have a privilege that you know one tenth of one percent of people will ever have any exposure to. Yes. What's your opinion of um, traditionally black uh, schools, like uh, I'm thinking on the college level of Howard University? Um, they're terrific. Those are outstanding schools. Um, and that was another issue or criticism that we have of Dalton today uh, is their college counseling. They have no familiarity with historically black colleges and don't give any kind of um, uh, useful advice to students applying to college that might be interested in those schools. And so I and others have said you know, to the school, um, you can't have a college advisor who's incomplete in their ability and skill set on college advice. They've got to do better. Um, you know, I went to Amherst College, and I went to Amherst College um, before it was co-ed. And so, in a sense, there's a parallel between that, and an all-male school and an all-black school, and so forth. I think that people should have the option of creating the environment that makes them feel comfortable. Okay? Which includes Richfield being an environment that makes some people feel comfortable. I don't begrudge anyone that. But I'm here and I want to be comfortable too. You know? Um, so if I'm here, I'm going to make sure that my elbows stick out. Yes? Were you, have you been here long enough that your kids have come up to the schools here? My kids started in kindergarten and went all the way through and graduated. Um, and I can't think of a better place for them to have gone to school. Um, they got an outstanding education here in Richfield, and, and I'm tremendously grateful for that. Um, but I will tell you, my kids would rather have root canal than attend a high school reunion in Richmond. <laughs> as great as the education was, they will never do come back for that. Why? 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 <laughs> <laughs> you want to answer. <laughs> that's, that's for them. You've got to sit in. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm not sure how much time I'm permitted to have left, so, you know. I'll sit down, but, but I'm, I'm relying upon um, the, 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 the ladies in the back of the room to give me these hand signals that say, go home, it's not funny. Um, yeah. What you're saying wasn't a good experience for your children? It was a tremendous academic experience and an awful social experience. Wow. Um, our daughter, um, and my lovely wife is over there, she is actually um, uh, an, uh, an educator in the school system here. He gets me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you cringing over there? Yes. Yes. yes, she wishes I would stop talking. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, our daughter has a, a, a cohort of friends from school that she is still very much attached to and, and very faithful to, um, but that is separate and apart from school. Our son, I, there's really nobody from his school days that he, um, you know, still socializes with. Uh, and there are some experiences that he had that still make him angry like it happened yesterday. It's because your kids were different and they were treated differently. Yes. In the same way you were at all. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, um, microaggressions seem small unless you go to school every day and they happen every day. Yeah. You know, 
then 10,000 mosquito bites can be fatal. The reference points for that are um, the minority students will have some kind of after school cultural event, um, a concert, a play, a poetry reading, something like that, that is you know, culturally specific and relevant. And it will be attended only by minority students in the audience, and the white kids won't show up for it. Yeah. Um, and there are um, courses in the curriculum that are electives, and the minority kids will be in the classroom and look around, and there's not a single white kid in the class with them because it's an elective, and they don't have to. Uh, and there are um, some truly outstanding, remarkable teachers that are giants in the profession, and they work shoulder to shoulder with some teachers that are just walking, talking assholes. Um, and school should find a better way of filtering out bad teachers. School should not let the bad apples slip through. Um, the stakes are too high in raising our children. Um, you know, every teacher counts. And a kid's life can really be darkened by one bad teacher. I had a teacher um, at Dalton taught a course on the history of the city of New York. Um, I won't mention his name, but uh, in the in the course he talked about how New York used to be a great city, and then all these immigrants started coming in, and now it's a mongrel city. New York has no culture anymore because it's got all of these different people. Who, you know, from all over the world and all of this other stuff, and the city doesn't have the values it used to have. And that's how he taught that class. It's time to go. Um, would anyone care to purchase a book? So now I go to the back of the room, and if anyone would care to, to purchase the book, and no hard feelings if you don't. This is a library after all, and you're in my little bar. You know, I've got to get it.